distribute the uh, other half of the genes. And it's better to have some of your genes represented than none at all. Now, as far as when, where, how, well, it's not that hard. You get information by way of energy. I had that up on the slide a minute ago. These systems have been produced in the lab since 1993. Stand by for Nobel Prizes. Do we know all of the steps? No. But do you know all of the steps in a historical sequence, such as each footstep Jesus took on his way to the cross? And if you don't know that, do you deny that the crucifixion occurred? I'm glad you would bring up an example like that. Uh, I don't demand that my tax dollars be used for the crucifixion of Christ to be taught in the textbooks. So I think you're missing a major point here. Uh, if you want your evolution theory to be what you said, you don't know how it happened. Okay, I can understand that. But yet, that's all you want taught in the school system at my expense as a taxpayer. Uh, here you are griping about uh, the creationist view when we're not using the taxpayer's dollars, and you get paid every week from the taxpayer's funding at your university over there, actually, or the no, school. No, actually, I don't, sir. Oh, it's not taxpayer. I mean, no. Eureka College is not? No. There are no tax dollars involved? That's right. Totally, well, good. Thank you very much. I'm glad to hear that. Uh, if you were, like Stephen Gould or some of these guys taking taxpayer's dollars to, to promote their religious worldview, uh, that, would, that certainly ought to be stopped. Same thing with universities and things like that. So you did not answer the question, other than to say, we're here, so it must have happened. You gave several examples, like yeast and bacteria conjugating. Giving examples of how certain species do this does not prove how it happened in history at all. So you did, did not at all answer the question. Now, you know, I want some scientific proof. Time. Science deals with knowledge, what we know. Time. Show me what you know about that. Well, you said you wanted to talk about carbon dating. Why don't you summarize your objections for the audience? It would be much easier if you would ask the questions in the order that I have the answers. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I cover carbon dating very thoroughly in my seminar notebook and on my website, drdino.com and on videotape number seven of my series. I cannot give a one minute answer to that question. Carbon dating, uh, two, I get three minutes. Well, if I had time to boot up some slides, it'd be quicker. Carbon dating was invented 18, or 1950, 47 to 53 by Willard Libby, University of Chicago, later moved to Stanford. Uh, Willard Libby made some fundamental assumptions which have since proven to be in error. He assumed that the Earth's atmosphere today was in equilibrium with the carbon. Uh, it's a little complex. I explain it with lots of pictures on my video number seven. But the sunlight produces carbon-14 in the atmosphere. Then it begins to decay or fall apart. The normal half-life is about 5,730 years. So as it's being produced, at the same time, it's being destroyed. It's a similar analogy to trying to fill a barrel with water if there's holes in the barrel. Pretty soon, you're going to be filling it, and it's going to be leaking at the same speed, and you reach a point called equilibrium where the, you'll never fill the barrel. Well, the Earth's atmosphere is carbon-14 is being formed in the atmosphere by the sun, by radiation and it's being destroyed by normal C14 decay. The equilibrium point, Libby and others decided, if you took a brand new planet Earth, stuck it out in the solar system, it would take about 30,000 years to reach equilibrium. It still is not in equilibrium. There is more carbon-14 today than there was yesterday. The carbon-14 in the atmosphere is still increasing, which means the Earth is not even 30,000 years old yet, which I could have told them just from reading the Bible. And the dating that they use, that carbon dating, which I showed you the examples of how they get wild examples from the same animal, but they only accept the ones that fit the geologic column. Dating is really done by the geologic position. It is not done by carbon dating. The objections I have to carbon dating are it's based on several fundamental assumptions. They're assuming that the rate of decay has remained constant all through history. We don't know that. They tested it for a few days in the laboratory. They're assuming there's been no contamination of this sample. They're assuming you can somehow know how much was in this object when it was alive. But if C14 is still increasing in the atmosphere, the animals that lived a 1,000 years ago had less C14 than we do today, which means they would automatically carbon date much older than they should because you have a rubber ruler to measure them with. And without taking 30 minutes to give a thorough explanation, uh, that's the best I'll have to do on that, but read my seminar notebook or videotape number seven or uh, give you any number of sources on carbon dating and how it's based on several simple fundamental assumptions, which simply are not provable. And there, isn't, there aren't any things dated in the geologic column 
by carbon dating or potassium argon or uranium lead or iridium strontium. It's all dated by geologic position, which is based on the assumption that evolution has happened, which is not true. This is your carbon uh, dating thing? That's an older one, sure. Well, that was the one I got out of your seminar notebook. Okay, what you have here is uh, someone who says that carbon dating is only good back to 3100 BC. That's very interesting since it has been calibrated using bars. Next slide, please. And keep going, going past that one. Uh, Hovind doesn't like barbs either, but there's an obvious difference between regular barbs and storm barbs. Next, please. And this is what I was wanting to get to, the VARV count, counting the number of VARVs versus the carbon-14 age going back 12,000 years, and now a chronology unbroken back to about 45,000 years. Is the amount of carbon uh, constant? Is it made in a constant uh, amount? No. But there are correction curves. Next. Well, let's see. I think you're over for two. You didn't explain where uh, life got started. You didn't explain how life learned to reproduce itself. Let's try a third one here. Um, natural selection only works with information that is already present. For instance, cows have the information to produce a leg, and sometimes they produce one in the wrong spot. A five-legged cow is born. But they don't ever produce a feather or a wing or a beak because the information is not there to produce something like a feather on a cow. The so how can natural selection, working with information already present, produce something new as opposed to uh, keeping the species or kind or whatever just simply to be a strong, healthy species? I don't see how you can get something new. How do you get a higher progressive, a higher life form from natural selection or mutations, or you know, explain how this works, please. How you get a higher life form? What number is that? Uh, number twelve. Natural selection only works with genetic information available Thank you. and tends to keep species stable. No problem. Okay, no problem. Good. This is a good question. Genes sometimes duplicate and perform new functions. You have genes for color vision in your eyes, except some of you males who have kind of not so good color vision genes. And these all can be traced back to a time when there were fewer types of color genes available. One good example of a new uh, function, this is uh, gray 67, are you ready? Okay. Would be to look at the color genes that are present in monkeys. Now, if a designer designed them, one would think that, well, yeah, they should have about the same kind of color vision because they're doing their monkey things and they're in the jungle and they're eating fruits of different colors. But if we look, the New World monkeys, the apes, and humans all have color genes that are very much the same. The, uh, the New World monkeys have color genes that are much less uh, developed. They can't see colors as well as we can. Uh, why?